Guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading on the show today, Jim Free is John Gambia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Best Damn Movie Related Show. I'm Plurid with Comedy from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. I'm going to lean a little bit this way today. <laughs> also, here's Mark Ellis. Uh, did, did the sneeze register? Do we do we have confirmation? Can somebody comment and let us know if they oh heard God. that? Because that was one of the tamer Harloff sneezes oh, yeah. you'll hear. He, that was not full on dad sneeze. No, no, no. Also, here, Christian Harloff. I've scared many people. Uh, Riley, every time I, when he oh, used to be in the man. office, Jesus! Is what he would say after. <laughs> it's horrifying. I love it. All right, a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today. Let's get things going. At this past year's CinemaCon, Spider-Man Homecoming producer Amy Pascal revealed the character was only contracted to appear in Homecoming, two Avengers movies, and one sequel after Homecoming. This was later confirmed by MCU head honcho Kevin Feige soon after. However, if Tom Holland is to be believed, it looks as though Spider-Man will go for at least one more movie after the Homecoming sequel to complete a trilogy. In an interview with Allocene, Tom Holland apparently let slip that there may be more movies after the Homecoming sequel. There is still a lot of room for Peter Parker and Spider-Man, especially to grow in the next two movies. He's definitely not the finished article by the end of Spider-Man Homecoming, and I really look forward to exploring the different ways he can grow up and go through puberty, I guess. It's going to be an exciting couple of movies. Yeah, there will be Spider-Man 2 and 3. It won't be Homecoming 2 and 3. John, thoughts on Holland's comments, and do you believe the MCU deal could be enough for a Spider-Man trilogy? Well, I mean, okay, one of the things that we know right now is that both Kevin Feige and uh, Amy, Pascal. Amy Pascal have confirmed that the current deal between Marvel and Sony only runs through what we are calling Homecoming 2. It'll be, it'll be Spider-Man 2, but uh, what they're calling, what we are calling uh, Homecoming 2. That's when the current deal ends. I have no doubt, though, I never had any, I don't think anybody's at this table or any of you had any doubt that they probably got story ideas running past that. Whether they get to do it now is the question. Look, nobody that I know has any real doubt that Sony and Marvel will extend their deal. It's just good for Sony, and it's just good for Marvel. So far, I mean, who knows? Maybe Spider-Man Homecoming bombs, and it's a disaster for both of them, but we all know that's not going to happen either. So I think I don't think Tom uh, Holland is wrong here, but I also don't think it indicates that behind closed doors... Sony and Marvel have already extended the deal. I just think they know they've got plans to go extending forward. And as far as I know, even if Sony and Marvel don't extend their deal, and of course they will, but even if they don't, I don't think that precludes Sony from using Tom Harland if they want to do their own Spider-Man thing and use him for a third look. So, so look, I do believe Kevin Feige and Pascal when they say the deal ends after Homecoming 2. I believe that. But I also believe Holland when he says we've got the material for three films and there are plans for a third one because there's no reason not to at least plan forward when everybody sees the writing on the wall and they know that this Marvel and Sony deal will be, expend, uh, will be extended. Anyway, that's how I see it. Christian, how do you see it? I don't disagree with you. I also think that, you know... it. I think that what Marvel and Sony are doing is they're doing it right. It's what, we, what we've talked about is don't just go ahead and say, oh, there's going to be uh, seven movies Power Ranger style. You know, there's going to be eight movies. There's going to be nine movies. They, Sony's been down this path before to where they've had you know, uh, these movies lined up. The last one didn't do well. They had all these movies lined up after with the Andrew Garfield, and it didn't go well, and they had to make this deal because they were so poorly received by fans and critics. So by holding it back and obviously behind closed doors saying, well, this is where this story could go. And obviously they signed what they did with him. What Warner Brothers didn't do with Patty Jenkins was they locked him down. And they have him for two and three. So he, as an actor, as a creator, it, well, we have this. We know how to develop Spider-Man going forward with the second film, the third film. And they have these ideas for him or where they want it to go. And I, as a audience member, I'm very thrilled to hear that. I'm very yeah. thrilled to hear that they're going to have more plans. I don't necessarily think it means that right now it means that Sony and Marvel are locked up. What I do think it, they're going to reassess after the second movie comes out. Okay, look, things have been working out pretty good. Let's sit down. We have the third movie mapped out, ready to go, planned out. Tom is locked in. 
Now let's talk about our deal. And that's, I believe, what's going to happen. I mean, I just think that they should just make this movie and then take their billion and a half dollars <laughs> and, and just away. walk away from the no. table. Yeah. Of course they're going to make more movies. Of course they wanted to be a trilogy. They wanted to be 10 movies. This is proof that actors are interviewed too much. When you stop <laughs> talking about the movie you're promoting and then you're just so bored, you're like, all right, I guess I'll talk about the other stories that we have here. Just, just talk about the movie. And when you're done talking about the movie, we don't need to hear it anymore because we're not dumb. We assume there's going to be a sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming that is probably going to be three and four and five. So as somebody who sees this stuff every day, I get a little tired of hearing about, oh, then we had this sequel plan and this sequel plan. I'm so excited for Spider-Man Homecoming. I don't blame Tom Holland at all. It's just that you get asked these questions day after day after day, you're going to want to say something different, and that's what he did. So let me put it to you guys, since the topic's come up here, let me put it to you guys this way. Let's play a little bit of over-under. I'm going to set the line at 10.5%. 10.5%. The chances that Sony and Marvel do not extend their deal <laughs> past the Spider-Man Homecoming 2, if you will. The line is 10.5% over or under okay here's what you got to think about though is that like like naturally our inclination would be take the under because things appear to be going so well but we don't know what marvel's plans for their universe is after infinity war it's true we don't know who's surviving infinity war we don't know who's going to die who's whose character is going to get killed off if they totally scrap everything and reboot it i'm inclined to say that's not going to happen because of all the excitement around guardians of the galaxy right now so it's hard to blow up the infinity war and all of those avengers if we're going to have guardians of the galaxy continue in the same universe so i think we're going to have spider-man around for a while i think it behooves marvel as much as it behooves sony so i'm going to say a convincing over over because the line is 10.5 it's a pretty low low number what do you think so over under whether or not they're going to extend their deal no, the, the over under 10.5 percent the chances that they don't extend their deal um well that they don't i i'd say i'd probably say over that they that they don't extend it i think that uh whether or not sony and marvel have they got to see what's going to happen past the second movie. I mean, that's that's the main thing is whether or not this movie is going to do. It, it's a risk. It is also a risk sure, because Spider-Man has been oversaturated over the last fifteen years as all the superheroes. So whether or not it's going to happen, I, I, it's barely over ten point five. I'm going to take barely under. I'm going to take the under. I'm going to say it's around nine percent. I mean, sure, because like I said, there's a lot of things that can happen between now and six years from now. But I'll, I'll still. Take the yeah. under, just barely. Okay, over under 10%, we see Tim Duncan in more Spider-Man commercials. Oh, over. Oh, Absolutely under. over. He was great, right? <laughs> Take the over. All right, what's next? Variety is reporting that Woody Allen's next film has found a very Oscar-friendly release date. The trade has learned that his drama entitled Wonder Wheel will debut in limited release on December 1st this year, just in time for an awards qualifying run before opening wide later in January. The film is set in Coney Island during the 1950s with a logline that reads, larger than life characters, lovers, infidelity, and gangsters. It stars Jim Belushi, Justin Timberlake, and Kate Winslet. Christian, with Woody Allen's Wonder Wheel set for release, do you believe it's already an Oscar contender? I don't know about that. I got to see trailers and stuff before and, and hear buzz before you say it's an Oscar contender. But what I will tell you, I'm very upset that this is not a prequel to 1980s, 81's The Toy with Richard uh, Pryor. <laughs> Richard Pryor. Wonder Wheel! <laughs> Look it up. Um, but <laughs> deep. That is that deep. Deep, deep cut. cut. Wonder deep Wheel. Cut. Wonder Wheel. First thing I thought. No, this is, this is... Woody Allen's movies, there's always that possibility that when you... When you watch one of them, you're going to get something that's just going to blow you away. And you're like, wow, it's another Woody Allen special. And then there's other ones like, eh, it's all right, not one of his best. With actors, he always gets the top tier actors. He always gets, the, there's always some fun witty dialogue. And it's always kind of, what's this one going to be about when you walk in? Because there's so many different movies that he's done and so many different you know things that he's whether it's a uh, was it Blue Jasmine that he did or something like um, a Match Point. I mean, there's so many different movies and different types of movies. So I want to see what he does here. I'm curious out of all of them. I'm curious to see how Justin Timberlake does because I want to see because Timberlake is a very talented dude. I don't think anybody questions that. You know, obviously musically, um, comedically, sometimes he hits, sometimes he's out of his element. Um, there's, there's love a, guru. Yeah, right, <laughs> absolutely. But there's, and there's other times that he crushes, like he's Saturday Night Live, and and then sometimes you see him dramatically to where he, he can hit in something like The Social Network, and then sometimes he's just okay. So I want to see what Woody Allen can get out of him. I'm a fan of Timber, Timberlake, and I want I would love to see him go to that next level as a as a performer as an actor. And Winslet's one of my favorite actresses of all time, so maybe she can also elevate 
him and this film. So I, Oscar, I don't know yet. I got to see the movie. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's very difficult. You kind of hit the nail on the head. It's difficult to off the bat discount a Woody Allen film from being like you have to think that if Woody Allen has a new film coming out. It could be an Oscar contender, just like whenever you hear Daniel Day Lewis, you know, once every five years is going to act in a movie. You just kind of assume it's a very real shot. He could win Best Actor, no matter what it is. Uh, I I think very differently than you on Justin Timberlake. Well, not all that different. Timberlake is lo one of the most talented dudes I've ever met. I mean, the, the dude is just loaded with talent. He probably is. I, I'll say it. He's my all-time favorite host of Saturday Night Live. I what? just think, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's don't get me wrong. I'm saying in, in the job of hosting Saturday Night Live, he is my favorite host on Saturday Night Live. Oh. Um, not that I think he's a better, more talented guy than Tom Hanks. I'm just saying as a host, if I could watch any Saturday Night Live. You've heard of a guy named Steve Martin. I, he's, and he's amazing. <laughs> I, he's great. But I honestly think he's like, I don't think he's that good of an actor. Yeah, I, 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 even in Social Network, I actually found his Sean Parker to be kind of one note. Really? Yeah, I, I've never. And uh, what? Uh, Alpha Dog. Alpha Dog. I, I also didn't think he was all that good. In, in time, that. runner, runner, in anybody? Time, I <laughs> runner, forgot runner. about the, both <laughs> no, of those movies. I, I yes. enjoyed. I enjoyed him in Runner, Runner. I just thought In Time was just it just the in material time. was not suited for him. But I'm less concerned about Timberlake here and more. I think I speak for everybody at the table. When I hear the name Jim Belushi, I think Oscar contender. <laughs> I will also say this: I think Jim Belushi's underrated. Mr. I think, Destiny. I think Jim Belushi. Jim, Mr. I'm Destiny, with you. I am with Mr. you. Jim Belushi is that guy who is just relate. You see him on screen, you're like, that's my uncle. You know? That, and, it's, and it's a harder thing to capture for an actor that I think he gets credit for. You know what he was really good in was about last night. Uh, was he in that? Oh, yeah. He's the best friend of his brother. Yeah. What was, yeah. what was the movie he was in with uh, Arnold? Where Arnold was oh, the Red Russian. Heat? Red Heat. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, Red <laughs> yeah. Heat. See, Jim Belushi. Now, look, is he his brother? No. But I, I just think, I think Jim Belushi. He's probably been dead for 30 some years. He still gets compared this to is, him. This is why you had me on the show, John. <laughs> is you ask about a movie's Oscar chances, I start talking about Jim Belushi's greatest hits. Um, I, no, it's it's too early. However, if it's a Woody Allen movie and it's coming out in December, I like its chances a lot more than a Woody Allen movie that came out in the summertime. So we had two examples of that recently with Blue Jasmine. That came out. That was primed as an Oscar. Oscar contender and ended up paying dividends. Then he had that one come out with Jesse Eisenberg and uh, uh, a lot of other people this past summer that did not hit that well critically, and it kind of got buried in the rest of the summer. So I think that if a studio is positioning this movie to be released in December, they like its Oscar chances, meaning I like Jim Belushi. Uh, just a quick thing. Since we're talking about Jim Belushi, I brought this up at the staff meeting. My favorite performance of Jim Belushi's, if you have not seen the movie he did with David Duchovny and Minnie Driver called Return to Me, it's, it's kind of a romantic comedy, but it's very emotional and very funny at the same time. Do yourself a treat yourself, hop on Netflix, hop on Amazon Prime, find, on, find it wherever you need to find it, and watch Return to Me. Treat yourself. I think you're going to enjoy it very much. All right, folks, we've reached out part of the show now called Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or a sell. So, Ashley, what do we got? After debuting at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival earlier this year, the first trailer for the indie comedy Brigsby Bear has finally landed online. The movie stars Kyle Mooney and Mark Hamill, with Mooney starring as a young man who grew up watching an educational children's television program called Brigsby Bear Adventures. His life is then thrown into upheaval when he learns his parents actually kidnapped him as a baby and raised him in an underground bunker secluded from the rest of the world. Brigsby Bear is directed by SNL veteran director Dave McCary and also stars Claire Danes and Greg Kinnear. It is scheduled to hit theaters on July 28th. Mark Byers saw the first trailer for Brigsby Bear. Yeah, it'll go to me first, Ashley. <laughs> I don't know yet. I, uh, <laughs> I'll buy it because I like the cast. Obviously, Mark Hamill's in it. I'm probably going to buy it. It's such a unique, different premise that I see the trailer and I'm like, I don't know that this is something that's going to speak to me, but it feels artsy and it feels quirky and different and the last time i walked into a movie that looked anything like this it was a michael fassbender movie called frank mm -hmm. it was just right, a yep. weird different movie that sometimes i really appreciate and other times i'm like i just want to see sharks attack mandy Moore. so <laughs> seeing this trailer i'm not sure it's going to fit with my jim belushi loving vibe but i'm going to give it a buy because artistically i'm intrigued enough Here's, this is a very interesting experience watching this trailer. Because here's the thing, I'm going to sell the trailer. I watched the trailer before I read the synopsis. All right? So I watched the trailer, I'm like, what the hell is this? Yeah. The, I, I have no idea what's going on. I know nothing about this movie other than there's a, a Ted looking dude walking around. <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> then 
I read the synopsis. And I'm like, oh my God, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. And then I go back and look at the trailer again and I see the, the trailer completely differently. But if you have to read the synopsis first before seeing the trailer to get what the trailer is trying to communicate, then the trailer does a bad job. So I'm going to sell the trailer. However, I am now excited as hell to see this movie. You're buying the synopsis. I'm buying the synopsis like crazy. I think this movie sounds brilliant. I can't wait to see it. But again, if you have to read pre-existing material before watching it, no. The trailer is supposed to be a piece of material that can be your first exposure to a movie to get you hooked into it and this trailer doesn't do it yes upon reflection after reading the synopsis it means a lot more but i shouldn't have to do that so while i'm dying to see this movie i'm gonna sell the trailer so i don't agree, disagree with your your points but I'm, still, I'm gonna buy it because i think that as i'm watching it it's making me think of movies that i really liked in the past and as i see these trailers and i don't know exactly what the hell the movie's about if i didn't read the synopsis and I'm looking at this trailer, and at the end of it, I go, well, it reminds me of like Eternal Sunshine meets Frank. Well, yeah, you were meets, mentioning that while we're watching. Yeah. And then you, and then when you do read the synopsis, it's like meets Room. It's like there's these three movies. A little movies. bit of Truman Show thrown Th in. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of stuff yeah. in here that it, it seems intriguing. The only thing is, I'm not a big Kyle Mooney fan. Um, I think that on Saturday Night Live, it's just a lot of this stuff that he does, like, and it's like the same thing over and over again. And I want to see him, very similar to what we were just talking about with Justin Timberlake. Mm. Can he now be thrown in this kind of dramatic role? Um, and I want to see how he does and how he's able to do it. Mark Hamill in there, sign me up. But I want to know more about it. But I, the trailer itself was weird enough and strange enough and gave me that independent vibe to say, okay, this is on my radar. I do want to see this. And I think the trailer was successful that way. It wasn't successful in the fact that it told me what the movie was about. But I don't know if that was the goal of this particular trailer. I was I think that the goal of the trailer was to go, look at this weird thing. Does it look interesting? And they're like, yeah, it does. So that's why I'll You know what really got me the end of the trailer when they all they're done with dinner and they shake hands? That was great. It was cool. just like so weird and different, but yeah. I, it was kind of funny yeah. and, and yeah. you remember it. Yeah. You remember yeah. it. I kinda wanted to do that now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Hey, that was that, that, that Well done. Good. That was well said. That was a good point, Mark. <laughs> um, yeah. So I again I, I'm I'm dying to see this film. I, you know, it, it, they quote in the movie quotes in it, a friend of ours, uh, Peter Serretta from Slash Film. Right. He's quoting, he loves it, and mm -hmm. I, I really like his uh, his taste in movies. So keep your eyes open for that. All right, what's next? Mission Impossible 6 writer-director Christopher McQuarrie took to Instagram yesterday to reveal that Michelle Monaghan, whose character Mary Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible 3, and who made another appearance in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, is returning for Paramount and Skydance's next chapter in the franchise. The follow-up movie to 2015's Mission Impossible Rogue Nation sees Cruise return, along with Rebecca Ferguson, Henry Cavill, Vanessa Kirby, Alec Baldwin, and Angela Bassett. Plot details are being kept under wraps with the film scheduled for release on July 27, 2018. John, do you buy or sell Michelle Monaghan having a bigger role this time in MI6? Oh, yeah, I buy it. I think she's a terrific performer, and I like the fact that just because she has been in previous films, if the story doesn't call for her to be in another film, then they don't put her in. I, feel, I really like that philosophy they've had, that they don't feel they have to shoehorn in every character. But that kind of tells me that if they're going to use her moving forward, that that means they do have a story purpose for her. And I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty cool. Now, I can't help but laugh every time I hear the name of Shell Monahan because for whatever reason, other than Big, my wife Anne's favorite comedy, I cannot tell you why this is her favorite comedy other than Big, is Ben Stiller's The Heartbreak Kid. Oh, my God. <laughs> in which, in which, what? so whenever Michelle Monaghan, we see a poster of her, all Anne does in the car, we'll pass by a billboard and Michelle Monaghan will be on the and just go, Miranda, because that's her character and yeah. she just says that. So a little bit of useless trivia there. Anyway, Mark, what about you? Um, I, yeah, sure, fine. It, it, because you know what's cool is that at the end of one of the Mission Impossible movies, it's like Tom Cruise, it's like he's always kind of kept his kept his eye on this girl that he's loved. So you have all these people that come in and out of his life from being a spy, but then he also has this quiet life at home that he got so close to getting in Mission Impossible 3. And then I think it was at the end of Ghost Protocol where he's just hanging out with Luther somebody, and then he just sees her while, and it's like he's keeping, eye, he's keeping tabs on this person because he does dream about one day getting back to that life that he's never going to get back to. Ethan Hunt's never going to give up the game until he eats it you know he's not he just he can't quit he can't clock out for too long but um 
Sure. I, I like that it's going to be Ethan getting pulled back because at some point Tom Cruise's character has to start thinking about the next step of his career or whoever's working with him at the agency has to be like, hey, Ethan, I don't know that you can still do this job. And then he has to prove him wrong for five more movies. Because you remember, in the, I, it was either the last one or two ones ago when they brought in the Jeremy Renner character. Mm -hmm. The initial philosophy behind that was, we're going to bring in the Jeremy Renner, and he's going to take over the franchise moving forward. And then, like the polls came back, and the uh, the, the test grouping results came back. It's like, no, it's got Cruise has got to continue to run. Wait, this Jeremy thing. Renner's biggest problem, you know, he's not. He's not Tom Cruise, and he's not Matt Damon. Yeah, Other than yeah. that, he's fantastic. I love Jeremy Renner. All right, what do you think? Uh, I buy it. I mean, look, if it, whether it's True Detective season one, Source Code, or one of my favorite, the first time I was ever I ever was introduced to her was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and oh, she yeah. is great. She is a great actress. Actress. She's underrated, to be completely honest with you, too. And I think that her character doesn't really serve more in this storyline and to be Ethan Hunt's kind of muse. And, and she, she's been the love of his life. And to have her back in a more in a stronger role, I'm happy for it because I think that if they would have done it in three, four, five, yeah. it, then it's like it's too much. But she's had that break. We've had that break from her character. So to put her back in in action or back in play, as they would say in Mission Impossible, I think that um, it's a good thing. I want and, and they have, like you said, they were writing it. They, she actually would fit the story here if we did this, this, and this. And you have a talent like Michelle Monaghan? Yeah, absolutely. Just have Tom Cruise, like, marry her and then just, like, retire to a couch. And then he can tell Rebecca Ferguson what to do, like, in the field. Like, just <laughs> right. give her advice. Is she in this like, one? Yeah. She is, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. She's coming back for this. So yeah. th that's why it's like, oh, you have an ass kicker already. So now Tom Cruise can just, he, he can just ease into, like, being like a backup quarterback. <laughs> All right, what's next? Variety is reporting that Jeremy Renner, Isla Fisher, Ed Helms, and Hannibal Burris have all signed on for the new line comedy entitled Tag, joining the already signed Jake Johnson, John Hamm, Annabelle Wallace, and Rashida Jones. And the movie is based on Russell Adams' 2013 story in the Wall Street Journal titled Tag, He's It for Another Year, about a group of friends who have been playing a cutthroat version of the children's game for the last 30 years. The movie is set to begin shooting later this month in Atlanta, with a release date yet to be determined. Mark, buy sell the cast and premise for the new line comedy tag. I so buy or sell an adult version of tag where you're just going all over the world. God, I want to play that right now. That sounds like so much fun. Yeah, I, I, I like the cast. Um, I, like we said, Jeremy Renner, big fan of him. Ed Helms is who we might have some argument here on the table because I like Ed Helms a lot more in movies than I was never a fan of The Office. I just... I don't like the office. Wow. I don't like feeling like I'm in an office. I don't care about everybody's take on what's going on in their office. I just, I wanted no part of that show. Ed Helms in films like Cedar Rapids really shine. So I want to see more of Ed Helms. I just didn't want to see him in the office. Sorry, Ashley, did we say who's directing this thing? Do you have that in there also? Jim Belushi. <laughs> Jim Belushi is directing this Jim movie. Jim Belushi is at the helm. I mean, I like um, the cast for sure. If, I don't know if they said who, who's directing it or not too, but it's it's got to... There's something interesting about it. There's something to see. You could just see the cast. It's like dodgeball, also to see what what's going to happen in these adults playing tag. How they're going to do it. How they're going to set it up. Where are their locations. Um, what it, what's at stake. So there's. It, it makes you say, okay, wait a minute. That with all these particular characters and the other ones that were already signed on. It could lend for some great comedy, depending on how the tone is, um, and it could be something pretty fun. It's being directed by uh, Jeff Tomsick, who also directed a lot of television things, uh, Broad City, uh, Wrecked, a couple things like that. I don't know that he's I, that, directed any features. That, to, to be honest, with you, that that's more encouraging to me than some of the other. I, after, I there's pretty, I don't know if they're embargoed, but I've, I've seen there's comedies that we've seen lately. I haven't been impressed with a comedy in such a long time. There haven't been any good comedies in so long, and I think that this they, they've been using a lot of the same directors. And there's I don't think we have any great comedy directors, and I don't know if this guy's going to be the next great comedy director or not. But newer talent, people who've been working in television, giving them a shot for film because we need b new comedies. Comedies so far, especially this last year, have been goffish. All right, folks. Well, listen, we do this show live, and as we do live shows, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live Twitter questions. You can start tweeting those questions in now, and then Wendy will pick a couple out. Simply make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Send on in those questions, and like I said, Wendy will pick a couple out. I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video. Yesterday, a brand new episode of John Schnepp and his crew with Heroes. A new episode of that dropped yesterday. It's online right now. 
And of course, you know, Wonder Woman is out right now. And Wendy, there's actually an online store for Wonder Woman. There is. So to celebrate, WB opened up an official Wonder Woman store. You can get it at uh, all the Wonder Woman stuff at wonderwomanshop.com. And they actually... Because they, they must know that I get freezing cold in this office. <laughs> because they, is it upside down? I can't oh, see. No, that's it good. It's great. good. Look at that logo. Uh, so, so I'm going to take this on the plane with me uh, on my upcoming trip. And then on the other side, too. Where are you going? I'm getting approved. If you want to be wrapped She's by Wonder down. Woman. Dang it. Oh, you actually got the character on the other side? Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> You're putting far down? too much no, effort perfect. into this. Nice. She is perfect. <laughs> I gotta say, that Wonder Woman logo, I cannot, there is not a better superhero logo than the Wonder Woman it's logo. It's a great logo. It is well, badass. The Batman logo. It's is... a bat, John. This is a kick <laughs> ass two W's. It's a good, it's a very good logo. Hey, and listen also, don't forget, every Friday on the Verizon Go 90 Network, new episodes of Jeremy Johns and his show, Awesome Tacular. Make sure you guys go and check that out. Now, one of the movies opening this weekend is the new uh, Mandy Moore film 47, 47 meters. meters down Woo! of course with Matthew Modine as well I know you're looking forward to that film a few of us are supposed to go see it tonight well we sent our own Perry Nemiroff to go and talk to the cast of that film and to play a little game of would you rather check it out let's start with the game we're gonna play a little would you rather okay love so it picking between it. the two telling me why you would choose one or the other okay would you rather make a movie with a CGI creature or a real animal um I would say a CGI, CGI creature, creature. Oof. That's a good one. I think both are difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, what animal is it? Is it a shark or a chipmunk? Well, that's because that really yeah. 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 exactly yeah. like real animal. Yeah, I go real animal as well. I've done enough CGI yeah, I mean, if stuff. You think of Leonardo DiCaprio and the grizzly bear in that movie. I think I definitely want to go CGI. Yeah. If it's a unicorn? Oh, there we go. If well, that existed? Clearly, I would that's say a unicorn or a CGI. Answer, you know? CGI. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I always go to puppies and kittens, so I'd always pick a real animal for that. Sure. Okay. Would you rather face off against a ghost shark or a shark to puss? Ghost shark or shark to puss? Ghost shark or shark to puss? That's a tough one. I um, think a ghost shark, because a shark to puss has too many angles it can come from. I'll go shark to puss. The I think ghost shark. It's a smart choice. Yeah, ghost shark, I don't know what I can do. I feel to... like you can defeat the shark to puss. Shark to puss, there's lots of tentacles and arms that I can maybe latch onto somehow. Either way, I think I want to steer clear of either creature. How do you kill a ghost shark, though? How do oh, you kill that, a shark? That actually is really. <laughs> A Let's shark, be honest. At least a shark to puss is like a mashup of two real animals. It has to be able to die. <sighs> Let's to hope so. Die. I've thought about this question too much. <laughs> Would you rather pitch something to the shark tank or run the American Ninja Warrior course? Run the Ninja Warrior course. If I would like to be able to run the Ninja <laughs> Warrior course. That is one of the hardest things ever. Pitch something to the shark tank. No, I'm scared of them. I want to do Ninja Warrior. <laughs> of I feel like I would I'd, lose that I'd Ninja literally Warrior. literally fall on the first obstacle. Like yeah. this, it would be an easy out yeah. for me. I wouldn't have to stand there in front of those guys. If someone gave myself. me an ingenious idea, I'd be part of the pitch for Shark Tank. I you, I feel like you could convince them. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're she's very a, kind. She's away with words. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, would you rather be a card shark, a loan shark, or a pool shark? Pool shark. Oh, a loan the shark means I'm rich. <laughs> Fair point. Would you rather find Nemo or Dory? Okay, can we look for both of them? Those are we have to choose. Oh, Nemo. Really nice I want to find Nemo. I want to just look at Nemo. I don't want to kill Nemo. I just want to just experience that great white whale. Nemo. Oh, I like Tori. <laughs> Tori's so going to forget you found her, though. Not if I constantly remind her of what I did for her. Remember what I just did? Remember what I did? I found you. I found you. You owe me for life. Thanks to me. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Isn't Nemo a white whale? No, Nemo's, Nemo's the, the little, little clownfish. From, uh, oh, I was thinking of of, no. of uh, Captain Ahab and yeah. Moby Dick. Would you rather be in 47 meters down, 51.399 yards down, or 154.199 feet down? I'm gonna go ahead and say that that's the same <laughs> All thing. All the same. There you go. Would you rather have a lifetime supply of gummy sharks or Swedish fish? Swedish fish? What is that? I've never even heard of that. It's oh candy. my god! It's candy. It's candy. You've never eaten a Swedish fish. I picked the gummy shark. I feel like you've yeah. never experienced Swedish fish. Though. I haven't had them. Maybe that's something I, I gotta you're, try. Well, you're in luck. Yeah. Oh, oh no way! Oh my god! I come oh, with boy. goodies today. I don't eat sugar. So I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll eat enough for the both of us here. Swedish Jeez, fish in there. Louise, cracking oh, yeah. this right here. Gummy sharks. Gummy sharks. Gummy sharks. Yeah. You got him? Outside. Wait, you got him. That's like the worst surprise ever. My bag is sitting outside. And you had gummy sharks. I have presents that I'll bring in after. Aw, oh, darn. 
All right, guys. Well, before we get to those live Twitter questions, it's time for us to go to the mailbag. Listen, if you want to get a question on mailbag, and we take a mailbag question every day, Monday through Friday, but we also have a mailbag show where we do nothing but take your mailbag questions on Saturday and Sunday. Send in your questions to collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, what is in the mailbag today? Ben writes, hello, Collider crew. I love your show. Harloff is number one. Yes. Christian, did you write this in or was <laughs> it yeah. actually in there? Okay. <laughs> Reviews for The Mummy are not so enthusiastic, which I thought was somewhat similar when Man of Steel got mixed reviews, causing the DC Cinematic Universe to have a rocky start. Since Wonder Woman saved the DC Cinematic Universe, which of the upcoming movies that Universal has planned do you think could save the Dark Universe? Well, I mean, uh, if Universal is to be believed, I mean, that's already settled. They're, they're putting out Bride of Frankenstein, which I believe is a questionable title to put out as your second movie out. Like, maybe Frankenstein, but Bride of Frankenstein? Is, I, I don't know. That seems odd. Um, it's not the one I would have gone with, but we'll see how that goes. What do you think? I think you got to go with Wolfman, which would have been the good call. Everybody loves dogs, so go with, <laughs> go with Wolfman. Get somebody so, somebody good. I think Wolfman, or like you said, Dracula, or redoing Dracula. One or, of the major characters, yeah. Yeah, just something, something big to where... Or, you know, I think that probably what they think they're going to do with Bride of Frankenstein, if you're going to look at it, the financial side of things, their reasoning behind it is... Look, I don't care. I mean, look, I don't like Maleficent. I don't like the movie at all. It made a lot of money. And one of the reasons why is because Angelina Jolie was front and center in that thing. The way she, she's a very good promoter. There's certain things that she can do in, in, a, in a recognizable role like that. And I think the business heads are probably like, well, get Angelina Jolie. Javier Bardem will be in the film, too. Those, those are some big names right there. They'll market the hell out of it. It'll do big international numbers also with, the, with that talent. Let's go for it. That's what you assume. But as far as fan-wise, I think that they should have probably went with something a little bigger. Yeah, but it, it, I don't disagree with you. I, I think what you're thinking they're thinking is, uh, is probably what it is. But I disagree with that line I of agree thinking. With you. Yeah, because, totally. I mean, yeah, the Maleficent made a lot of money. It was a Disney animated you know, classic character, blah, blah, blah. I and mean, then she put out another movie. What was it called? Do Me By The Sea or whatever she did with Brad Pitt. Just <laughs> By The Sea, Joe. <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> just By The Sea. What yeah. was it? By The Sea. Yeah. Those are the behind Sorry. the scenes. Sorry. But, yeah. and that, like, well, tanks. Well, no, well, but the, but the and it's got two that. big stars and no one's going to go see it. So. Smaller movie and she directed that thing I, based agreed, on the book. Agreed, but I'm, I'm saying it was like, I think no you marketing. would agree that Hey, just putting that name in it does not guarantee anybody's going to go to see it. No, and but I think that she will have the marketing machine, the, true. the different budget from what she had from Do Me By The Sea or whatever it was. Is that she's going to have a way <laughs> different marketing budget. She's going to have, uh, it, it, it'll be a little different, but I still don't know if that particular character is the way you want to go for your second film. I agree. I think? disagree with you boys. I think this is a smart play. Angelina Jolie aside, you have to do something different and you have to take a risk because we are sick of Dracula. We got Dracula Untold and it sucked. We got the Wolfman and it sucked. And those were five, six years ago at the most. So you need to do something different because look at how audiences responded to The Mummy, which we got... 15, 20 years ago. And they're like, oh, even Tom Cruise is in it. it. just It's another mummy movie. We haven't seen a Bride of Frankenstein movie in a wide release in a long time. I think it's the right play to go. If you rely on a female character to get you back with DC, rely on a female character to get you back with the dark universe. It's not a, that, that point, though, is not whether or not, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with, with the Bride of Frankenstein being the one to go second. I, I don't. But the trend now, uh, the fact that whether you go to Star Wars with Rey, Rogue One, yeah. Felicity Jones, Wonder Woman, the trend itself, you know, the fact that, that this new that what is happening now, the fact that women are actually taking a hold and being leads is not is a great point because that also could be another an, another marketing decision, not just the money itself and not just having the star of Angelina Jolie, but having that front and center now. Because Wonder Woman, this is what I said about Wonder Woman, how socially important this thing is. It's changing. It's going to change the game, and it also the way the same way Hollywood will do something to where uh, you know, like if, if someone made a, a movie about a, a, an animated movie about a sleeping fart, and it did amazing, <laughs> it, it's absolutely amazing, and then everybody's making sleeping fart movies. It's the same thing. Oh, the hot trend now is is the fact that Wonder Woman. Whether there's there's absolutely a good reason to do it, and then there's also the the people who are going to do the money side of it, who are just going to think, put a woman. Put a woman in this, put a woman in that, and it, and it's a good thing that that's happening also too. Because if you have Bride of Frankenstein and Angelina Jolie is the one who is is going to be running front and center, more women will have more opportunities, more movies will happen. I think that Wonder Woman and Patty Jenkins have paved the way in order for this to happen too. 
All right, guys. Well, I said we saved some time to get to your Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Jay Patel, who writes, which is more frustrating, a movie that starts off strong with a bad finish or a movie with a bad start that finishes <laughs> strong? Um, probably a movie that starts bad is more frustrating to me because I, and you know, different people, we all you know, absorb movies differently. To me, a movie can have a bad third act, but if I really enjoyed the first two acts, I'll still walk out being enjoyed and go, ah, it could have been great if the third act was better. But if a movie doesn't get me in that first act, if, if it doesn't hook me in and get me enjoying myself in the first act, then by the time you get to a great third act, for me, it's kind of too little, too late. It's like I'm already not on board with the film. So for me, I'm more frustrated when a movie starts weak. But I'm sure all of us would have different answers to that. What do you think? I have a different answer, yeah, because I, I, can, I can see myself at the end going, look, it was started off slow, but man, what a finish. It finished so strong that I'm like, okay, I forgive what happened in the beginning because what an ending. I'm super disappointed if I'm watching a movie and it starts off so good, I'm so invested, and then it just goes... And at the end, it's like, that really? You set me up for that entire thing, and that's what you give me at the end? Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely more inclined to love, I, I'd be more forgiving if a movie starts off a little slower or not as good and then just punches me at the end. Uh, yeah, the first horse out of the gate doesn't always win the race. It's from a sports game I watched one time. Um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of a movie that started off bad that got really good at the end. Like, th there's the movie, um, the Swiss Army Man started out weird, and it took the first act to hook me, but once it did, it made me appreciate the first act, and then I loved the rest of it. So I can think of a lot of movies that started out really strong. The Melissa McCarthy comedy, The Boss, I was howling for the first act and a half of that movie, and then they threw a curveball in there that just killed the entire flick for me. So I would much prefer a movie to start off slow and then get me by the end than to start off with a lot of momentum and then totally fizzle out. But I'm trying to think of a movie, we'll have, to, we'll have to do this on social media later, where you think of a movie that really was bad, it was a bad movie to start out, mm. and it somehow managed to find its legs and be great by the end. All right, what's next? This next one comes from Alan Payne, who writes, what is the best or worst thing about doing movie talk? Thanks. Ooh, well, the best thing, I, I mean, just getting around to sit, sit around a table with your friends and talk about movies is great, and getting to interact with the fans is great. The worst thing is, I don't know, uh, I get up early in the morning, so that's not even a bad thing for me. I mean, I know it's tough getting a... Uh, you got a long commute to get here in the morning. Yeah. So that's, that's tough for you. Yeah, I mean, that's the, I think that the hardest thing would be the drive here in the morning, getting here on time, but I, I do it. Um, and best thing, yeah, absolutely. I think to be able to express live every day our thoughts and to be able to talk about movies every single day, different movies, different directors, different actors, be able to talk to certain uh, people who make these movies that we are privileged to see. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't even have a long commute anymore. I'm not a big fan of getting up early, but I guess the biggest problem with doing movie talk is that my back starts to hurt after carrying the cast day <laughs> after day after day. It gets to be where I need, like, a chiropractor. Maybe we can build that into my next contract. Sure, and which is why you don't see uh, Mark Ellis on every single movie talk. I can't do it, John. I can't do it. Yes. <laughs> All right, what's next? John Morgan writes, with Cars 3 out this weekend, what is your favorite Pixar movie? Mine is Monsters, Inc. There, I mean, it's it's answer one A, one B, one C, one D, one E. I mean, Wally -E is genius. <laughs> Up is genius. The Incredibles is genius. Ratatouille is genius. The Toy Story trilogy, one of the best trilogies of all time. I mean, it's oh god. I, yeah, I, I throw like Toy Story in there. Nemo is probably in there for me, and then The Incredibles probably those. those three What's ones. the hilarious romp where the guy's wife dies slowly That's in front up. of us? Um, <laughs> I loved up, but I would probably say Toy Story 3 is my favorite because that one really gets its hooks into you emotionally, especially at the end. But there's so many great ones as long as you get rid of that, that trash cleaning robot. What? He you didn't, you oh, don't like Wally? See ya. Yeah. Oh my God. Have fun with your show tunes, loser. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I would discard Cars 3. I would <laughs> throw Cars 3 Cars out the window, 2 is great, though. <laughs> I, I love I know Cars you're the 2. the one guy here who likes Cars say, 2. I had a blast with Cars 2. More right. blue-collar comedy guys in Cars movies. There you go. And Jim Belushi. All right. <laughs> and this Max's is the guy that's carrying us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his back's getting a little sore. Yeah. 
Uh, All right. I feel like Mark's like trolling us right now. <laughs> I'm not. No, he no, said, no, no, he, he really does like he cars too. Really he really does. I mean, I never yeah. saw it, so I can't, I can't really judge. The one thing I am not, not Wendy, good. is a troll. Having said that, I will ask you three questions after the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, boy. <laughs> All, All right, right this next? next one comes from Logan Morrell, who writes, um, at this point and the way the DCEU is pre- progressing, uh, do you think that we'll see Jared Leto laugh again as the Joker? That's a good question. Yeah. I, 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 I really hope, look, I, I, I really liked Jared Leto's Joker. Do I like the way they used it? Not necessarily. Do I think they mismanaged the character in that movie? Yeah, I feel like they kind of mismanaged the character. But I thought, you're running out of new ways to do the Joker. You're running out of new ways to do the Joker. And I thought Leto did a really solid job of bringing us a Joker that was clearly in spirit the Joker, yet was clearly very distinctive from the Joker Jack gave us, or from the Joker that Heath gave us, or from the Joker that Caesar gave us, or the Joker that Mark Hamill gave us. Like, he made it a very unique Joker while still clearly being the Joker. I would love to see him back as the Joker with, uh, I mean, a lot more emphasis and used a little bit better. But honestly, at this point, I mean, we're hearing a lot of different things about, like, he didn't like the response he got, he didn't like the way the character was used, maybe WB wasn't all thrilled. I'm not sure. So, I, I wouldn't say one way or the other whether he's coming back. I, I mean, I hope he does, but I just don't know if he will. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I still don't. We, we went through this marathon with all the Batman film news. Like, so is Reeves doing the movie or not? I can't remember. Is Matt Reeves directing? There hasn't been any more word. The last word was yes. That he was. Yes. Okay. We and haven't heard anything to, to, to call that off. Right. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Leto's going to be. <laughs> Here's what happened. No, they, not they had a meeting with Matt Reeves. There was a lot of shouting. Yeah. And I then just, a week later, he said, okay. I just I'll do don't it. remember. What, it, was, it was so much drama. It was like a soap opera. But I think that. That doesn't mean that he's going to do it. If I was Matt Reeves, I would stay away from the Joker right now. And it's nothing against Leto. I would just stay away from I would introduce something, someone like the Riddler or the Penguin or even... I love the Deathstroke it, idea. I really it, did when they Deathstroke. initially had Right, I would idea. just focus, on, some, that, I'd focus on somebody else and create... Because Batman arguably has the best villains out of any comic book uh, movie ever. So I would like to see them do that and sit back on the Joker for a bit. I don't know if Leto will come back or not. I mean, I also think I'd still like to see him get another shot with, and nothing against David Ayer, but I'd like to see someone else's use of him and see what they can do with him, but I don't necessarily want to see it in Matt Reeves' Batman if indeed that's happening. I think uh, when you would see it would be Gotham City Sirens. Probably and true. it's just a matter of whether that movie gets on the shelf. I wonder if the Batgirl movie gets fast-tracked, if there's going to be any sort of Joker appearance in there because the Joker may factor into Batgirl's backstory. You may have a Batman movie where the Joker is still around, but I think that if you're going to see him, it's going to be Gotham City Sirens, and he should be played by Jeff Foxworthy. (laughs) (laughs) And at this point, again, I mean, depending on how serious Warner Brothers was when they put out that statement there, they're saying, until Justice League comes out, the terminology they used is we're taking our foot off the gas for now. So, like, we'll see when all this stuff uh, comes together. And I personally think the Warner Brothers is taking a really smart approach to it right now. All right, last question of the day. All right, last one comes from ECAM, who writes, do studios pay companies for product placement or do companies pay studios? For example, Dairy Queen in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and Krispy Kreme in Power Rangers. Uh, yes, uh, studios do not pay companies for free advertising. Of I like products. how you answer that like Jeff Goldblum. No, yes, the no, the companies will pay the studios, and they will pay significant, depending. I mean, just because you see in a movie and a guy happens to be holding a coke can, that that just might mean because the character needs to be holding a coke can at the time. It's not necessarily product placement. But when you go into another movie and every other scene has a shot of a guy's computer monitor and it says, you know, Hewlett Packard on the end or whatever uh, some big uh, monitor manufacturers right now, or you're constantly, the Krispy Kreme thing in Power Rangers yeah. was so obvious. But no, <laughs> the companies pay studios to do that product play. Have, you know, working in the studio system, have you ever seen the reverse of that? No. Because the whole point is you're trying to, the studio and the production companies are trying to get money that they don't necessarily have to spend on their own to do it. So they get some more money. It helps with the budget. It helps pay out things, too. Like you said, Krispy Kreme comes in and says, hey, what if we do this? We'll write you in. Give us this. You know, and it, you make deals. And the same thing, like, look at the last Transformers movie. I bet you Mike, Michael Bay and Paramount, they, they made a lot of deals with a lot of different companies. And it was everywhere, like, just product placement diarrhea. Mark, has anybody, <laughs> has any studio ever offered... You money no, to be able to put the name no, Mark Ellis around things? Nothing. 
I've I've been get I've been showing it for a long time. <laughs> Got nothing. I wonder if uh, if what what went down between the studio and Google for uh, the internship or whatever. I wonder if they maybe mm. went to Google and were like, hey, can we can we because. Because Google doesn't need, Google's not like, oh, we need to be in this new Owen Wilson, Vince Vaughn movie. But it really helped right. legitimize that film because it wasn't just some random made-up That's up a little different, company. though, yeah. It, felt, it yeah. felt real. And um, I'm sure the studio had to reach out to Apple a little bit to make them Steve Jobs well, flicks. That's a great point, though. There are, there are different, like, when it fits the story as far as where the placement is, and I think studios will go out and talk to them about that because where it's, you're advertising for them, but it's, you know, it serves the actual story, but the actual product placement of whether or not, you, like my one of my favorite ones, no one's gonna know this movie is is Rad in 1985. Oh, I when remember Rad. Crew Jones does a a flip off the kicks bowl. I wonder what you know. Remember the cereal kicks? They still make that cereal? Probably not. They no, they make kicks. Do they still? You're, you're a father. You should know this. <laughs> exactly. I don't. I she. You not she buy the cereal? Cash. You, you guys that. keep cereal. Do you guys I, like I, feed the kid cashy? Well, she eats kale every morning. Uh, she eats kale. Kale. No, she needs kale. Uh, she had it once. My father only gave it to her. She threw up all night. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, that'll do it for this small movie talk. You know, some people are wondering how come uh, for most of this week we've just had three person panels? Because I've been carrying it, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's because there's this little thing called E3 going on, and we've got a lot of our crew down at E3 every single day this week covering it, and you can see the results of all that. Actually, we have a Battlefront video up right now with you and Jeremy Johns. You can yes. Getting your heads on Battlefront, so that's on our channel right now. My my expert playing, and uh, of course this week's awesome tacular with Jeremy Johns is going to be basically E3 stuff. So make sure you guys tune in for that as well. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? You can find me online playing the only game that matters, John. The game where you take lines and you make four of them at a time using blocks. I'm the best that ever lived. Come at me, Tetris fans. MarkEllisLive.com. You can take a seat me at Jacksonville this weekend at the Comedy Zone. Sitting right beside me over here, Christian Harloff. You find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff. And yesterday's team match between DC Movie News and Cinema Blend is up now. Friday, big one between Josh McCuga and Drew McWeeny on the Schmodown. Sitting over there, the one of the only Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And right beside her, the Wonder Woman blanket adorning, of course, the big fan, <laughs> Wendy Lee. Hair. Wendy, where can people find you? And my hair, my new hair. Uh, you can find me on the Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can find me and my new hair simply on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.